Hi there. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Brittany Blaine Roth, and this is Andrew Waldo, and we are fisheries biologists with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sport Fish. We are here today to teach you how to do a salmon dissection. Here in the dissection, we're going to follow our salmon dissection guide, which you can find in the link below or on our website. The first thing you're going to notice on the guide is there's a list of materials that you're going to need to do the dissection. During your dissection, you're going to want some paper plates and a Sharpie. This is what you're going to set your fish parts on, and you can even label them if you want to. You're also going to want something to cut your fish with. You can use scissors, a Zack knife, which is this safety knife we have here, or a fillet knife. It's really important that you teach your students about knife safety and how to properly handle knives and make sure they have good adult supervision with them. You may also want to use a pair of tweezers. Those can help you remove fish parts or the otolith or ear bone. Plenty of paper towels, trash bags, make sure all of that's available as well. And more than anything, we want you to have a great time teaching students about how to do a salmon dissection. Um, so please utilize this resource that we have available to you on our website. So as we go through this dissection today, I'm going to ask Andrew questions here and there. So first off, Andrew, I want to know what's the first thing you notice when you picked up this fish? It's slippery and slimy. All right. Well, that's because uh, salmon have a slime layer on them. Um, this slime is really important. Um, it helps to keep predators away. It helps them slide easier through the water. Um, it also ha helps to protect them from disease and fungus. Um, if you were actually out in the wild and you caught this fish, you would want to make sure you got your hands wet. Um, if you had gloves on that you took them up off before you actually picked up this fish and handled it. Do you know what's under the slime layer, Andrew? Scales. Oh, okay. And so, do you know what the scales do? They protect the body. That's right, that's right. Um, the small scales, um, they're hard plates like fingernails, and they cover the fish's whole body. Um, the fish actually always have the same number of scales their whole life. So as they grow, those same amount of scales will be on their body. They'll, they'll just grow as the fish grows. Um, there's also, what's really neat about scales, it's something we use to actually age the fish. So if you were to take and look at the scale under a microscope, you would be able to determine um, the age of the fish. You could look at how many years it spent in the fresh water versus the salt water. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate how to remove a scale from this fish. Um, if I was actually sampling um, for a field project, I would uh, take and make an imaginary line between the tip of the anal fin and the back of the dorsal fin and go just above the lateral line here and pull a scale. So you can actually just kind of put the tweezer under there and it pulls right off. And then I've got a scale that I can take back and put under the microscope. So next we're going to go over the fish shape and features. So Andrew, what shape is this fish? This fish is the shape of a torpedo. Fish are shaped this way so they can swim easily through the water with the least resistance. Versus there's other fish like a halibut that's like more of a flat fish. So it's just a different body shape for different species of fish. Now we're going to go over the fins and tail of the salmon. So Andrew, tell me how many fins does this fish have? This fish has eight fins. First we're going to start with the paired fins, the pectoral fins, and the pelvic fins. Next we have the anal fin and the dorsal fin. Then we have the adipose fin and the caudal fin. Each of these fins is used for something different. The paired fins are used to help the fish turn from side to side or stay down in the water column or on the bottom of the river. The dorsal fin and the anal fin are used to help keep the fish upright so they don't fall over. I like to think of it like the fletchings on an arrow. It keeps them going straight. The caudal fin is used to propel the fish forward. In the adipose fin, we don't know the exact use for this fin. In the hatchery environment, we remove this fin so that we, tell, we can tell when a fish returns, and if it doesn't have one, that it's a hatchery fish. So Andrew, now tell me, is it okay to hold a fish by its fins? No, when you catch a fish, you do not want to hold it by the fins. You want to pick it up out of the water and cradle it without sticking your fingers into the gills. So next we're going to go over the lateral line. Andrew, can you tell us about the lateral line? So the lateral line is what the fish use as their ears. They don't actually have an ear. On the, along the lateral line, there's little holes, microscopic holes, that have a little hair in them. These little hairs pick up vibration and pressure changes in the water. This is how they can tell if, say, there's a bear behind them in the creek or if there's a fish next to them. They can also use their lateral line to tell where they're at in the water with the pressure changes and how close they are to the bottom or the surface. And this lateral line is located on both sides of the fish in the midsection from the front to the back. So now we want to show you the difference between a male and a female pink salmon. 
Um, I'm holding the female pink salmon, and as you can see, she's got uh, kind of a you know more round belly, soft belly. Um, that's because she's got eggs. Uh, versus Andrew has the male. They have more of a muscular belly because they have milk. And as you can see, my female has a smaller head, um, and she doesn't have, um, she doesn't get this hump. So as you can see, Andrew's male is starting to get a little bit of a hump on top, um, and that's, that's indicative of a male pink salmon. Another thing indicative of a male salmon, as you'll notice on their upper jaw, it's hooked. This is called a kipe. Normally the males develop this a lot more than a female. We are ready to start our dissection and cut into the fish. And again, I want to remind educators to please uh, go over your students with how to use a knife safely if your students are going to be the ones cutting into the fish. So Andrew's going to go ahead and cut into this fish. And like we told you, this is a male he has in front of him. We'll find out right now if, in fact, we were right. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm using a Zach knife. Insert the Zach knife into the anal vent here. Then you're going to pull it up between the paired fins, both sets all the way up to the gills. Sometimes it doesn't go all the way the first time, so you just have to slip it back in there and rip. You wanna be careful not to stick your knife too deep because you can cut the internal organs. Now that we have this fish cut open, we can look inside and we can tell that this is a male by the milt sac. This milt sac is rather hard because it was caught in the salt water. If this fish were caught on its spawning grounds, this milt sac would be very soft, filled with a milky-like substance called milt, spelled M-I-L-T. So with the fish open, I'm gonna go ahead and remove both of the milt sacs. There's one on each side. The best way to do this is up near the gills of the fish, you're gonna reach your hand in and just pull out softly. We wanna be careful not to disturb the other organs of the fish. All right, and we're gonna set them on a plate. There's one, and then you're gonna pull the internal organs up and grab the other milt sac and pull it out the same way. So in your classroom, you may have a male or a female, so we're gonna go ahead and open up a female for you to see as well. Um, so following the same process, I'm using a Zach knife. I'm gonna insert it into the anal vent, and I'm gonna pull it. I'm gonna try not to go too deep so that I don't puncture the egg sac in there. Like Andrew said, sometimes you have to go over it a second time to get all the way through. But as you can see, this is a female, she's got eggs. There's two egg skeins and I'll go ahead and remove them both and put them on the paper plate. There's one. Once again, just like removing the milt sacs, you wanna make sure to lift the internal organs up and be careful not to pull on them too when you remove the skeins so you don't remove the wrong organ. Some of the eggs may fall out. Um, there's thousands of eggs that a salmon has. If we take a closer look at these skeins, you'll see that they're really tight. Um, as the fish gets closer to the spawning, um, these eggs will actually become really loose. So you may have looser eggs depending on um, what kind of a, a fish you're dissecting and how far along it is in the spawning process. Andrew's gonna dive in now and remove the largest organ in this fish. Does anybody know what that is? It's the liver. So the liver in the salmon is right here, tucked up under the, basically the pectoral fin. So when you go to remove this, you're gonna wanna lift up with your pointer finger, and you're gonna feel a little part where it's attached. You're gonna wanna pinch that and slowly pull it out. It's really important that now going forward, uh, when you're working with your students, that you follow the guide. If you get too far ahead, you won't be able to get the organs out as well as, as Andrew's gonna show you here today. The liver is this largest organ. It is dark red and firm in texture. It destroys old blood cells and it assists in digestion by secreting enzymes that break down fats. The gallbladder is the sac attached to the liver in which bile is stored and used to digest fats. Now that I've removed the liver, I'm going to go ahead and remove the heart. When you go to remove the heart, you want to make sure you pinch at the insertion of the ventral aorta, which is the white muscular structure attaching the heart to the gills. The heart feels tough, but it is very flexible. It is a strong muscle. You also notice that the ventral aorta is very, very muscular. That is because this muscle is pushing all of the blood through the gills, so it has to work very hard. All right, now we're gonna talk about the digestive system of the fish. The first part is the mouth. If you notice the teeth on the salmon, they're all faced backwards. 
They even notice that on the tongue there are teeth that are faced backwards. This is because salmon don't chew their food. They catch it and then they swallow it whole and those backwards facing teeth keep the salmon for, or their prey from getting away. Then you'll also know what's, notice what's called the gill rakers. Those prevent the food from going into the gills. And then if you look farther down the fish's mouth, you'll see the esophagus. Now we're going to switch to the inside of the fish. So you're going to look inside and this large white tube that feels fairly rubbery is the esophagus. First thing we're going to do is cut it right as far up as we can. All right. Now we're going to be very careful when pulling it out because you're pulling out the entire digestive system. It's often best to set, the, set it down and then grab the intestine and cut it off at the vent. Now that you have the entire digestive system out, go ahead and lay it on a plate. All right, here's the esophagus. The first thing you're going to know if you roll it between your fingers is it's very rubbery. This is because it needs to be able to stretch. Remember I said that the fish doesn't actually chew its food. So this esophagus has to be able to expand and contract when it swallows its prey whole. Next, you're going to find its stomach when you follow the esophagus to the end. Sometimes I like to see if there's anything left in the stomach. So what you're going to do is press your finger on there and run your finger all the way up the esophagus. So this just has a little bit of mush left in there. This is because this fish was on its way to the river and it had stopped feeding. If this fish had been caught fresher out in the ocean, there would probably be some uh, food that it had eaten in it. After the stomach, are these stringy spaghetti looking things. These are called the pyloric cica. This is where the nutrients is absorbed out of the fish's food. After the food has gone through the pyloric cica, most of the breakdown has taken place. It'll go into the large intestine, similar to our large intestine. These fish don't have their small intestine like we do. That's what the pyloric cica are. Then if you run your finger along the large intestine, another substance comes out. That's the waste. That's where it would come out of the vent. Then there's one more piece attached to the digestive system. This is the spleen. You'll notice the spleen is dark red. That's because it works with the blood. This is where the white blood cells are produced and the red blood cells are recycled. Now that we've removed all the other internal organs, we're going to look at the swim bladder. First thing I'm going to do is take the straw and poke it into the upper end of the swim bladder, right here. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult, but once you get it in there, you're going to get it between the two layers, and then you're going to blow in your straw. Okay, so now that we have air in the swim bladder, you can see how it's used in the fish. So. In the wild, when a fish is swimming, they use the swim bladder to control their buoyancy. So for a salmon, they're able to basically uh, almost burp air um, versus other species of fish, like a rockfish, have a different type of swim bladder. It's called a closed swim bladder or a, a physoclistic swim bladder. So the difference between a physostomus and a physoclistic swim bladder is meaning they're able to burp this air or not. Now that we've removed the, or blown up the swim bladder, we can go ahead and remove it. You're going to want to gently put your pointer finger underneath it you can slowly rip backwards, removing the swim bladder. Sometimes it doesn't all come out in one piece. There we go. If you're able to get it out in one whole piece, you can actually inflate it like a balloon and put it in a bucket of water. All right, now that we've removed all the other internal organs, including the swim bladder, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the kidney. So this is the kidney here. So to remove this, it's probably going to come out in multiple different parts. If you've ever cleaned a fish, you've probably done this. So you're going to poke your fingers through and just run your two fingers all the way down along the backbone. Okay. And then you're going to have to scoop a little out. Now you're going to want to be careful because there may be some sharp vertebrae underneath found right along here. And now that we have all these parts out, you can also see the rib bones right along there. So the kidney has multiple functions. Um, they remove waste from the blood and produce urine. In between the ribs, there's tissue. That is the muscle of the fish. That is the part that we like to flay off and take home and eat. Now we're going to talk about the gills of the salmon. Salmon or fish have gills. We have like our lungs. This is where the 
fish gets the oxygen from the water. Covering a salmon's gills is the operculum. If you tap on it with your finger, you know it's a hard, bony plate. This plate protects the gills, just like our ribs protect our lungs. So when you lift up that operculum, first thing you're going to see is there's multiple different layers of the gills. And then you'll see the white inside part of the arch. That's the gill rakers, as I mentioned before. That helps protect the gills from the food that the fish is eating. And they're kind of hard. You can go ahead and feel them with your finger. On the outside of the arch are the gill filaments. You notice these are kind of flat, and there's a lot of them. This is because there needs to be a lot of surface area for the fish to get oxygen out of the water. Salmon are actually really unique. They can remove 80% of the oxygen out of, their wa out of the water, where humans, when we breathe, we only take 20% of the oxygen out of our environment. So now that we've opened the gills, we're going to go ahead and remove them so we can have a closer look. So you're going to cut up near the mouth and go ahead and pull out a couple rakers. Now that we have a piece of the gill structure out, you can see that these are kind of off-colored. That's because this fish has been dead for a while and frozen. If this fish were fresh, they'd be bright red. That's because all of the blood in the salmon has to go through these gills to get oxygen. So it's really important if you catch a fish that you don't just stick your fingers under the operculum here and into the gills to pick it up. When you do this, uh, you risk damaging uh, the way they breathe. Um, and when you have them all the way out of the water, um, hold your breath because that's exactly what's happening to them right now. They're not able to get oxygen. So just remember, if you're handling a fish in the wild and you're going to let it go, don't stick your hands in there and try and keep the fish's head in the water. Now we're going to talk about a few other senses that the salmon has. First, we're going to talk about the eye. You'll notice that the salmon's eye is different than ours. They don't have an eyelid. That's because they don't need to moisturize their eyes like we do when we blink. Their eye is always in the water. So what we're going to do is you're going to stick your fingers in behind the gills and up into the head and push up on the eye. And you can actually pinch the eye and remove it by pinching off the muscular tissue behind the eyeball. Now that we have it out, you can take a closer look. The next sense we're going to talk about is the sense of smell. If you notice, right in front of where the eye was, there's a hole. This is the nares. There's one on each side. This is how the fish smells. Fish rely on their smell once they're closer to their natal stream to find their way right to where they were born. Now that we've talked about the salmon's sense of smell, in eyesight, let's talk about their sense of hearing. If you'll notice, they don't have ears. Like we mentioned before, they use their lateral line to sense vibrations, just like our ears do for sound. Now we're going to talk about the salmon's sense of taste. If you look, the salmon actually does have taste buds on their tongue. We think that they can taste salt, sweet, bitter, and acidic things. Now that we've covered everything else on the salmon, we're going to talk about the head. So I'm going to go ahead and cut into the top of the salmon so we can look at their brain. So I'm going to go slightly behind the eye where the head goes from smooth to scaled and make a diagonal cut towards the eye. Then I'm going to come in front of the eye and cut diagonally back towards that same cut I just made. And we're going to take this piece out. Now if you look into this hole, you can see their brain and the different lobes. Behind the brain are two ear stones, or bones, that sit in a fluid sac called the otoliths. These otoliths help the fish maintain balance. They can be pretty difficult to find. We'll see if I can find them. So otoliths are a, a calcium carbonate structure, um, and we do use them to age fish. Um, similar to the scale, we can get the age from the otolith. There's two. There's one on either side of the brain. So if you're actually reaching in with your tweezers to try and reach them, reach right alongside and slide the tweezers alongside of the brain. All right, this is one of the two otoliths that I removed. You can see they're kind of an off-white color and fairly difficult to find. You can take and soak them in water and then put them under a microscope, and the lines that show the age will start to show up. That concludes our salmon dissection. Please make sure you dispose of these fish properly.